Avis. Cette capsule a été produite simultanément en français, en anglais et en espagnol. Notice. This episode was produced simultaneously in French, English and Spanish. Aviso. Este episodio se produjo simultáneamente en inglés, francés y español. Vous visionnez présentement la version anglaise. You are currently watching the English version. Actualmente está viendo la versión en inglés. Hello and welcome to Stereotypic Estiest. I'm your host, Guy from the other day. Today we're going to talk about an action slash shooter puzzle and platform game known by different names, which game was requested by a subscriber to my channel. Designed by John M. Phillips and published by Houston Consultants, this game is Nebulous, released in 1988 for the ST version. Before digging into the game, I invite you to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, to join me on my Facebook group to keep you informed, and to contribute via Patreon if you like what I do. Thanks to my patrons. Now, Nebulous. Nebulous is a hybrid game that combines platforms and shooter. The setting is on the planet Nebulous, precisely where giant towers have been erected in the sea without any building permit. The objective for each of the levels is to move your protagonist, Pogo, around or through these cylindrical towers to their tops within a time limit in order to demolish slash destroy every one of them while avoiding enemies and hazards along the way. Each successful segment is punctuated by an underwater sequence where Pogo must travel to the next tower while collecting bonuses that will increase the time allowed to complete the upcoming stage. It's almost a PUAP. In fact, the manual is only about 10 pages long and it is in three languages. What distinguishes it from what was done in 1987 or even before is the cylindrical tower, which quickly turns out to be somewhat disorienting. Usually, in platform games you go left, right, up or down. The background is a setting and nothing exists in the opposite part or behind. Even when there's an opposite side, say, the universe remains presented with a background and we understand that we are simply in a neighboring room and that to get out of it, we just have to use the door. It's hard to get lost, although in the case of Nosferatu, the universe is huge and sometimes there is more than one way to reach an exit. In some games, moreover, the action can take place on two distinct levels, that is, in the foreground as well as just a little behind, as is the case in Bonanza Brothers which can add to the puzzle aspect of the game. We can therefore avoid enemies by not being in their way. And when it comes to climbing, we're not off the hook. One of the oldest examples is Crazy Climber, in which you have to climb skyscrapers while dodging obstacles such as objects dropped by residents, to name a few. In fact, Nebulous borrows a bit of all this in terms of concept, the tower, the obstacles, but there's usually only one way to get to the top. The original idea for the game came from a demo designed by John Phillips for the ZX Spectrum, with a cylinder presented horizontally, but soon John turned to the Commodore 64 for the realization of Nebulous in its initial version, with a tower this time shown vertically and platform ledges all around. It's trial and error, and by heart. The protagonist is controlled using the joystick. Left and right are used to move Pogo in the desired direction, or rather to scroll the tower in the opposite direction. Up is used to enter an opening or to go up. Down is used to go down. And the button is used to shoot a projectile or to jump when Pogo is in motion. This is why the game is a PUAP. Just playing for a few minutes is sufficient to find out what does what. The interface is also very easy to understand. 
The play area dominates the screen. At the top is an info bar that informs us of two things, the score and the countdown. The score, I don't care. It's the countdown that must be taken into account. Because aside from the antagonists along the way, your main enemy is time. By the way, in regards to antagonists and hazards, they usually don't kill you, but they can lead to your downfall, literally. Hitting an enemy causes you to tumble or fall off the ground, for example, which causes you to lose time unless you plunge into the water, in which case you lose a life. In addition, some platforms can play tricks on you. Some disappear when you step on them while others propel you in a certain direction. The first trap of the game is precisely a platform that disappears. Splash. Fair or dishonest? Rather frustrating, especially the first few times you play. It's not only that time is running out, but also that residual time is a bonus, and in the more advanced levels you will definitely need time. From a visual standpoint, it's spectacular on the SD. First of all, more than 16 colors are displayed simultaneously on the screen by redefining the color palette during the vertical blank. For the sky, it's the color chosen for the background that changes according to the Y coordinate. For water, it's a bit trickier as there are shades and animations which involve changing a few colors rather than just one. The tower itself is composed of a set of segments as well as steps or ledges, segments which show some distortions. It's a 2D set that scrolls in a loop, but which is partially displayed on the screen with distortions toward the edges. Note that the latter relate only to the tower per se. The antagonists, who are usually sprites representing, say, spherical objects, have none. The protagonist, on the other hand, has several frames of animation. He remains fixed in the center of the screen, except when he jumps. It's the setting that moves. The whole is embellished using a parallax effect caused by the displacement of the distant elements. Achieving this is quite simple, and we can move those visuals in chunks of 16 or 32 bits, because what matters in the playing area is what's in the foreground. Speed of execution is essential. For underwater scenes, we also exploit parallax effects, and it's exemplary in fluidity. Nothing very complicated, but once again we change the value of the colors in the palette for some scan lines during the vertical blank to illustrate more than 16. Which brings me to talk about the scrolling on the ST. Usually, for smooth scrolling, black borders are used at the edges of the screen, borders each measuring 16 pixels wide, in order to hide the scrolling work that is carried out in the background. In Nebulous, we don't quite have these hidden areas. It's because, in fact, we don't really need them. What should be partially displayed is done in the background, and what is visible in regards to the tower remains of the same size. The offsets and distortions of the sets are already in the reserve memory, and overall there aren't that many. They are mainly repeating patterns. What hog the memory are the various distortions. The tiles for a given tower, for example, measure 128 by 16 pixels. This represents 1024 bytes. If there are 16 offsets for these tiles, because of the distortions at their edges, we are at 16 kilobytes of data for a single tower. Since there are 8 towers, that's 128 kilobytes of data, not taking into account the platforms or ledges, the elevators, the protagonist and the antagonists, to name a few. The game having been designed to run on a 520ST, the tower tiles alone represent almost 29% of the usable memory. But since speed of execution is of the essence, we don't really have the choice of preparing or not certain visuals in advance, and that goes for the underwater segments. In short, let's consider what is illustrated as being a flat decor that scrolls in a loop, for which we will only show half of what is visible. What protrudes on the right is eventually transferred to the left and vice versa, but only with respect to the X and Y coordinates relative to a hidden universe. I dare to say that the concept is one that allows for very fast and smooth scrolling. It's well thought out. In terms of sounds for the SD version, the tone channels are generally used so as not to monopolize the processor except in certain portions of the game where digitized music is heard via the noise channel during scene changes for example, or at the beginning of the game, or at the end. 
Of course, this is one aspect in which the Amiga version stands out, to name a few. The gameplay remains excellent in the SD version, which means that the Amiga only wins by one notch over the SD for Nebulous 1, that is. Because there is actually a sequel, Nebulous 2, and that one didn't come out on the SD. Usually I would say it's a shame, but in fact, it might be better this way because we might have had to downgrade the Amiga version to adapt it to the SD, or maybe not. Perhaps there was no interest. It must be noted that Nebulous 2 was designed and coded by a team, while Nebulous 1 was by a single individual. I won't talk about all the existing versions of Nebulous, nor all the names that the game goes by, but only focus on a few, including the C64 version, which has less animations and visual effects than the SD and Amiga versions, but still is very playable. I note for this build that the protagonist Pogo is a sprite that is rendered at a 320 by 200 resolution, while for the rest of the game the resolution is halved. Since we're looking into the 8-bit universe, here's the version for the Amstrad CPC. Pretty and colorful, but so slow that the gameplay is affected or even amputated. In return, I appreciate the effort for the soundtrack during the game. Still in the 8-bit universe, here's the game in its NES version, published under the name Castellian, a decent rival to the C64 version, with its soundtrack again, which could eventually turn out to be somewhat annoying. However, Pogo is no longer an underwater traveler, and the bonus stages consist of a succession of platforms on land. Of course, I have to talk about the Amiga version, impeccable, very fast, which is one of the best in all its aspects, visuals, sounds, animations. I'd say the ST adaptation is very well done, and that goes for the Acorn Archimedes version, but if you want to experience Nebulous unknowingly or knowingly, that's up to you, I'd say to start with the Amiga version, even though the game was coded for the Atari before being ported to the Amiga. Now, as usual, I ask the question, could we have done better for Nebulous in its original version? In addition to having a level editor, I would have dared a random mode. The universe is not so different from other puzzle platform games, except that a door can lead to the opposite side of the tower like a portal or a warp. The challenge for a random mode would be or have been to ensure that each level is or were completable in at least one way. And how does Nebulous hold up after all these years? It's a lot of by heart, as well as trial and error, as I said earlier. The difficulty increases, of course, but there are only 8 levels, which means that once you know the solution for each of them, you can try out some speedruns. The game is so unique that I don't really have any examples of sequels based on it, other than Nebulous 2. The heritage may not be as easy to define as one would like. Games in which you have to climb, enter a door, hide in order to avoid antagonists, there have been plenty of them since. And long before Nebulous, there were games in which you had to climb the walls of a building while dodging obstacles along the way to the top. The concept of climbing while avoiding obstacles originated somewhere in the early 1980s, with Crazy Climber, mentioned earlier, as well as Donkey Kong, released in 1981. What distinguishes Nebulous from others is the endless presentation of the universe due to the geometry of the cylinder. This is how the game is a puzzle. We don't escape the context by leaving the screen by one of the sides, and in short, there is no break nor relief because certain antagonists sweep the screen from right to left or from left to right according to the location of the protagonist and that to avoid them, you have to either change levels or go through a door. This was today's episode. If you enjoyed it, please give me a thumbs up. I'd like to thank John M. Phillips for his contribution to this episode. As always, subscribe to my channel, support me via Patreon if you feel like it, and let me know in the comments of your appreciation of Nebulous or puzzle games in general. How did you find it? What would you have done better that has not been integrated into Nebulous 2? Also, if there are or any other games you'd like me to talk about, let me know. The list of requests is long, but I'll get to them eventually. I'm Guy from Vierde. See you soon.